All right. So sorry we're a little late if you uh, if you were waiting for us. Welcome to our session on this is on sustainable capitalism, particularly on pledging trust towards sustainable capitalism. I'm Adi Ignatius, the editor in chief of Harvard Business Review. And uh, we have a tremendous group of panelists to talk about really the challenge of making our economies and our businesses more sustainable, more inclusive and more long term oriented. We want to address the question, particularly in the context of the covid pandemic. And what is what it has revealed and how it might create an opportunity for progress. We'll talk about how business can respond to the moment and we'll talk about how governments can partner with business to create a more inclusive and trustworthy world. We have a great panel. We have uh, Rania Almashat, the Minister of International Cooperation from Egypt. We have Ayman Azat, Chief Executive Officer of Cap Gemini in France. We have Hank McKinnell, who is the chairman of Moody's in the USA. And we have David de Rothschild, founder of Voice for Nature from the United Kingdom. Again, I'm Adi Ignatius, the editor in chief of Harvard Business Review. So let's launch right in. And Minister Almashad, I'm going to start with you. Uh, as I said, you head Egypt's Ministry of International Cooperation. When you think about this issue of, of stakeholder capitalism, of a sort of broader definition of capitalism, to what extent in your mind can international cross-border work help to advance some of these goals, or to what extent is it really just up to individual companies to step up? Yeah, well, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this uh, discussion. Uh, I think what the uh, pandemic uh, has uh, taught all of us is no one is on their own. Uh, only through collaboration will we be able to build back better, and that's where uh, the governments uh, feeling that it is a collective effort uh, to push forward. Um, if I think about uh, the World Economic Forum's context, and I think in their annual meetings, uh, there are seven principles of stakeholder capitalism that have emerged, if you will, uh, uh, during the pandemic to basically help everyone sort of streamline their thinking under inclusive uh, economies. Uh, and here you have a gender agenda, which is important, social solidarity and, and safety nets, which are very important. You have uh, harnessing the fourth industrial revolution, the importance of digital skills for people and trying to close that digital divide uh, and not be afraid of technology, because before the pandemic, there was a fear uh, of technology and that there's going to be uh, jobs displaced. But I think now there's, there's, there's better acceptance uh, of and importance of how we weave that into our, our, our work. Third is the environmental uh, aspect, and all of us uh, now are taking uh, uh, environmental sustainability uh, at the core, whether governments or businesses under the ESG uh, agenda. Uh, and also uh, the health, uh, uh, extremely important, and how uh, what governments are doing on that front. And then we have agile governance uh, also, which is uh, something that uh, uh, is under these principles of stakeholder capitalism. So I believe that you know, the pandemic has given us uh, or has sharpened our focus, uh, has made us uh, more inclined uh, to cooperate further, uh, try and cut through any inefficiencies or distortions so that each and every resource can be used efficiently. So that's just at the outset. And here we have uh, the international community being a partner alongside governments, business sector, as well as civil society in any economy or any, uh, in any country. All right, that's great. I, I want to bring in Hank McKinnell, who is uh, the chairman of Moody's. You know, this is a big topic in, in the U.S. Um, as well. You've been chair of the U.S. Business Roundtable for, for three terms. You know, the Business Roundtable famously revised their statement on the purpose of a corporation to include social responsibility. Can you tell us a little bit about, about why that happened and how, how meaningful that, that really is in your mind? Well, thank you. And thank you for hosting this panel. Um, I don't speak for the Business Roundtable anymore, and I probably never spoke for the 180 large American corporations that are the membership. Uh, but it's important to realize that good corporate citizenship has long been rewarded by employees, by customers, by regulators. Uh, for 50 years now, you didn't want to be a bad actor. You wanted to be considered a good corporate citizen. So what changed? 
Well, two major things changed. One is government has failed to deliver the changes that people expect in a range of issues from climate to income inequality to racial inequality. Uh, there's a very long list. And there's been a greater expectation that business would now do a greater share. But what really changed the dialogue were investors. And investors realized that most businesses run on a three to five year cycle, but they're managing money in some cases for a hundred years. Some of the university endowments, some of the index funds, uh, they're going to hold those shares forever. So for them, uh, rather than three to five year performance, it's really long term performance that matters and it's sustainability that matters. And not only doesn't business survive in a uh, climate meltdown, nor do businesses. So there's been increasing demands from investors to be remo- to be more responsive to social issues, to longer term issues, uh, which in part is what motivated the change in thinking uh, at the business roundtable. Now, uh, the change is quite significant, actually, that for 100 years now, the purpose of the corporation has been uh, benefiting shareholders. But there's a recognition you can't really do that unless you're also paying attention to the needs and expectations of employees, of customers, of regulators, of uh, those with a stake in the, in the business. So it is quite a significant change. All right. I, I, I want to come back to a lot of those themes with the group later because, you know, it is an interesting moment in history. So thank you. Um, maybe for a European perspective now, I want to call on Ayman Azad, who's the CEO of Capgemini. And, you know, from your perspective, you know, we're all talking about this reorientation toward a more sustainable, more inclusive model of capitalism. But I'd love your thoughts on what's what's the most challenging part of, of this commitment that so many companies and, and, and countries are driving toward? Well, at first, I mean, there are several components. First, thank you for having me. I think it's a great panel. As you imagine, this is one of the most important topics we have been dealing with uh, over the last uh, 18 months and even longer than that. Um, the, the ch- we see, we see several, several stakeholders and several challenges. First, you know, it's, it's about the planet, of course, because we talk a lot about sustainability. But uh, as the minister says, it's also about human capital and people. What we do there is, of course, also about governance and how, how we manage the, the arbitration between a number of different aspects. I think on the stakeholder side, which I think is the most challenging thing, especially you know, if you take my role as a CEO, is to ensure actually I, I, I am able to find the right equilibrium between the different stakeholders. And it is the employees, of course, it is the clients, it is the partner, the shareholders, and it is society at large. And what is more challenging in a certain way than before, you have to on a continuous basis, make, make some arbitrage sometimes between that to be able to find the right equilibrium between stakeholders, to be able to ensure that you're going to create not only a sustainable company, but also a sustainable future uh, and sustainable planet. And that's probably some of the most challenging things. So the thing we have to deal with, for example, is how do we deal with the pandemic? And I'll give you some, some of the things that we have done. For example, you know, a number of people have started focused a lot around cutting costs, freezing salaries, etc. We, we, we felt it was irresponsible to go because there's just a pandemic to go and basically not do salary increases or not paying bonuses. We had to take care of our employees and treat them well, you know, independent of the environment. And this is part of responsibility. You know, you could take the attitude of saying, you know, I have to care about my shareholders. The year is going to be difficult. I have to basically only manage my profit, so I'm going to cut everything else. No, we didn't cut everything. So I think part of the change in terms of attitude, in terms of cooperation, in terms of, you know, the seals of cooperation is to try to find the right equilibrium and to be frank, to be able to sustain some pressure from different stakeholders. create a sustainable, basic environment and, and uh, you know, economies and, and growth for the future. And uh, with that, it's to, it's to deal with the different components, you know, sustainability, you know, committing to net, ze- net zero. And what does it mean? Not just carbon neutrality and doing offsets, actually, you know, having the right commitment in terms of level to really reduce your carbon footprint. 
And I'll give you again an example we have done. We don't know how achievable it is, but we have taken the pledge that we will not go back to more than 50% business travel than what we had pre-pandemic. Is it achievable or not? But everybody has committed to it in the company. You know, we, we, we shifted all our cars to hybrid and, uh, and uh, electric cars from today. Today, people, if they want something different, they have to come to me for approval. Nobody else can approve in the company the fact they don't get that. So these are the kind of things that really shows commitment and shows the direction in a company and basically get people to really change in terms of their attitude. And I can promise to you today, when you talk about, about diversity and inclusion, what happened in the U.S., you know, with, with the African, African-Americans, I took a pledge around that. And my son, who basically lives in the U.S., in Chicago, he told me, he responded, sent me a, a message, told me, you have done the right thing because people leave companies who basically are not taking the pledge around that. So you have to deal with all of that, and it is challenging. It is not every day easy, but it is part of day-to-day life. I mean, corporate social responsibility is not something on the side on which you're going to do a nice report every year with a number of actions so that you fulfill goals. It is something that is part of daily life around how the corporation lives every day, and it's about every single decision we make every day has to be aligned we said that objective of sustainability. All right, more more good topics to come back to in a second. I, I want to bring David de Rothschild into the conversation, the founder of Voice for Nature. Um, you know, let's talk more about the context of COVID. Um, you know, this has been maybe a test case. Um, how companies have responded to the pandemic challenge maybe is a test case for how they can can uh, sort of coexist in a multi-stakeholder world. What's your, you know, do we need any more proof that doing the right thing pays? I mean, what have, what have you seen during this past year? Well, firstly, thank you to the panel. Um, it's a real honor to be part of this and this discussion. And um, I think I have to sort of go back to 2006. Um, I had just spent 110 days um, trying to ski from Russia to Canada across the Arctic Ocean. And I got off the Arctic Ocean and during that time, uh, a man by the name of Al Gore had, uh, had, had made a film called Inconvenient Truth. And um, this sort of green demic was suddenly waving around the world. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, suddenly everything was green. The cover of every magazine was green. Everybody was talking about sustainability. Everybody was um, talking about, um, you know, a changing world, our relationship to nature, our relationship to each other. And there was a real sense of um, anything's possible and optimism and this incredibly scary hockey stick chart that um, Mr. Gore was presenting to the world sort of suddenly hit everybody. um, and, and, And there was this reaction. And I sit here today in 2021 with the same narratives, um, exactly the same narratives. And I'm going to say not I'm optimistic, but I'm 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 an optimistic pessimist. As a species, we're incredible consumers. We're not incredible conservers. We're having the same conversations and the conversations, while they are active and they are much more prevalent across society and we're much more aware and we have, you know, weapons of mass distribution where we're all on our devices, addicted to these devices every day. The reality is that if we're still and I would throw this back out to my friend at Moody's because he spends a life rating things. If we don't have consistency in how we rate these statements, if we don't have um, accountability And if we are still using these statements with inside of the same system that put us in this mess, then we're in trouble. So we talk about stakeholders and shareholders, but we, we, you know, we we don't talk about nature as a shareholder, right? We talk about the privileged few who could invest early or the privileged few who can afford to buy stocks or the privileged few who have the fortune to be able to create these kind of companies that then can amass a huge amount of fortune, a huge amount of wealth. And so we still live in a greed guilt culture. And I, it doesn't, it's, you know, none of this, you know, the irony of being called Dave de Rothschild doesn't wash over me. You know I mean? When I say all of this, you know, we live in a greed guilt culture, which means we amass a lot of money. We suddenly see our mortality or there's something happens in our life. We set up a foundation and then we say, well, we should write a check towards nature or we should write a check towards society. Um, you know, it is becoming more integrated. I do feel we're in a second wave since 2006, but I also think it's really important to realize that we, we, we shouldn't be kidding ourselves. 
right about really the amount of change that needs to happen i've watched this you know the millennium development goals which was you know in 2000 be this hell you know this is you know this is this moment this coming together 20 years ago and when we realize that we may not achieve those things what did we do we created the sustainable development goals we took what was called csr which just became a little bit like loose around the edges and so we called it esg right so we're really good at labeling things but when there's enormous pressure on you as a shareholder to maximize profit at all costs you have to ask yourself are you doing the right thing for the interests of society and the interest of the planet it's 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 something that's really hard to do i've never met an individual who does not like nature who 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 is you know sitting at the heart of things and nature by the way i look at it as it, it's the cooperation between humans and all the other species that we share this planet with you know i've never met you know we, we work with it we live with it we all have this you know sort of interaction with it because we are nature so i don't think that it's an easy challenge um i'm gonna shut up and let the, the group jump on my head um and everyone else who's commenting at the moment but I, I do think we have to get very serious there is a huge funding gap when we look at the sustainable development goals i mean it's enormous and we're talking trillions of dollars that are, are, are missing every year from this goal. We will miss the goal and we'll push it out again. Now, things can happen incredibly quickly. Innovation and businesses doing things that are changing the market. Entrepreneurs are changing the market incredibly quickly like never before. So the appetite is now, the technology is there, the information is there. And if we can combine society with government and with business in a truly harmonious way and work harmoniously, which we've seen at, at, in this extraordinary year, we've seen this, then, then there is possibility. But if we become self-interested, if we become nationalized, if we become sort of, um, you know, closed down again and put, you know, our self-interest first, our profit first, or, you know, and we've seen that happening already in, in Europe. I hate to say it, but with the, with the distribution of the jabs and various other things, if we start to kind of creep back into those old habits, then those habits will be the unlocking of what we see as a, as a corporate, you know, as, as a, as a, as a, uh, a communal society, which is what we need if we're going to survive. So I, I think those are some good provocations and I'd, I'd love to hear from pretty much everyone about them just to steer the conversation a little bit. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think it was Hank who said that we had a hundred years maybe of, 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 of a kind of approach where we maximize shareholder value. I, I'd say maybe not quite a hundred years, maybe back to Milton Friedman. And I think that's more a question of, uh, it's been more of a fad than a matter of law. I think, you know, CEOs uh, and money managers have said their fiduciary duty is to shareholders, but have defined shareholders very narrowly as in maybe people who have owned a share for five minutes, you know, rather than a kind of long-term approach. I think we're rethinking this, but there's the danger, and I think this is inherent in what David was talking about, that this is a fad, this is a trend. You know, our, our young workforce is making noise and people are making noise, so we're moving now, is it is it sustainable? So Hank, maybe you can start. I mean, you said things are different, but we've said that before. I mean, do, do you really think things have fundamentally changed in, you know, in, in context of, of, every, of the skepticism that, that David just voiced optimistically. Well, these, these concerns are certainly valid, uh, and the questions are good ones. Uh, I would just say that I'm of the philosophy that things are accomplished at night while government sleeps. Uh, businesses are really good at turning ideas into action and action into outcomes and results. That's what we do. We're really good at that. Uh, the challenge here is uh, the incentives and defining the metrics. So, for example, in addition to being the uh, former chairman of Moody's, I'm also the former chairman and the CEO of Pfizer. So. for these broader social interests. The problem is if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So how do boards of directors set objectives? How do they provide incentives for management to achieve ESG investments? Uh, there is a very large body of work developing now, uh, in part led by Moody's, around how you measure uh, impact on the environment. 
uh, a carbon tax, frankly, would be very helpful because then you would have a dollar you can attach, attach to uh, carbon emissions or raising. Uh, will it happen next year? No. Uh, probably took us 50 to 100 years to get where we are. I suspect it will be another 50 years to get where you want us to be. We don't have 50 years, so we have to do it faster. So there needs to be a real focus on measuring results, rewarding results, having shareholders buy into the idea that that may have be a penalty in the short term, but it will be a very big benefit, uh, not only for all of us, uh, but for the stakeholders in that company in the short term. So I'm very optimistic. Uh, it is a messy period we're in right now. Uh, but the terms will get defined. Boards will start setting objectives. Uh, in the United States, the Securities and Exchange Commission will start setting standards on disclosure that will start to drive change. Um, I think we're going to see some really significant change, uh, hopefully in time. But that is going to be a challenge. Can we achieve results quickly enough? So, can I, can I come in? Uh, please, um, I was just going to call on you. Yeah, please jump yeah, in. Well, you know, I, I want to thank David for, for being uh, uh, sort of uh, the conscious of the uh, of the conversation. And and I just want, I mean, he, he mentioned 2006. The reason why we are unable to continue on a path is because there's always an external shock. 2006, as you said, I love that word, a green, a green dynamics or, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what you mentioned. But then 2008 happened. And you had the whole world, you know, with a huge crisis across countries. The difference between 2008 and 2020 is that the crisis, uh, that uh, the, the financial crisis was caused by uh, a human, you know, the, the impact that it had, the virus had on humans. So this, the, the, the feeling of, of collectiveness is very, very different than 2008 because the crisis was, uh, if I can use the term, uh, uh, you know, started by greed, if you will. Here, everybody was in tranquility, and then we were all hit uh, in uh, uh, by by a common shock. The the other thing, uh, which is quite different uh, than two thousand and eight, is that um, uh, the the stimulus that governments are putting in now are being, uh, or the the hope is, and this is something that we're implementing as a government, is to put environmental standards. So your your point about quantification is exactly that. The point about accountability is exactly that. The other point that you bring up is the financing gap. Yes, there's a huge financing gap and it's getting bigger. So what we're trying to do, and I can speak about what we're trying to do in this ministry and, and, and in Egypt, is how, how can you identify how much is needed on each SDG or each MDG with whatever you know acronym we're going to use, uh, uh, to to be able to create the green or protect life underwater, uh, create renewable energy for everyone, no hunger, no poverty. But I I, I have to say that um, um, the the ability of citizens to communicate, the ability of one idea that goes across the globe uh, more fast than where we were in twenty in two thousand and six, that is what creates uh, mm -hmm. I would say more pressure. Uh, on governments, on businesses, uh, uh, to move uh, ahead quickly. Will we be successful? We're trying our best. We, we That metric does exist uh, for CEOs, and I think there's like the 100 uh, companies that signed in in, in Davos in, in this January that are trying to, to implement all of this. What we are trying to, uh, what always stifles us and holds us back is an external shock that basically comes and, and pushes us off balance uh, from where we want to go. So, so I, I feel that um, uh, everything David said is absolutely correct. And it's very important to remind ourselves not to get trapped in a sexy narrative, but actually take that narrative and try and quantify it. And I feel that the benchmark where countries will be compared and where uh, businesses are going to be compared in the period ahead is going to be uh, on, uh, on a lot of the environmental Pointers, and that's why today what we talk about is not a recovery. We talk about a green recovery, and and each and every country will be able to get more access to financing in the international market if it is mindful uh, 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 of the of the environment. So it's 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 a lot of the uh, sweat that you've put out, David, over the years that now somehow uh, is going to be paying off because 
uh, uh, the pandemic has really uh, made everyone have more empathy towards the environment, more empathy towards the human capital, uh, more empathy towards putting health first and social solidarity first. So I think it's been a it's been a, a very tough test, but the silver lining in it has been reshuffling uh, uh, the way and reprioritizing the way governments, businesses, civil society, and the international community collaborate in order to push forward uh, in a more conducive fashion. And I'm not I'm not being optimistic or pessimistic. I'm being as <laughs> as possible because we are doing things on the ground as policymakers, at least here. Uh, from my from my chair with the flag on my right uh, to basically try we we don't know where we are that that we need we need that um you know the ESG is very hard to measure. I mean, I, I see ESG ratings from different rating agencies of the same company and they're all they're wildly divergent. So there's clearly no consistency. A lot of this data is self-reported, not checkable. It is subjective at best. Um, I mean, you, you know, you that must be part of you, you must be thinking about ESG data. You know, is, is it any it, it, it's, it's a great symbolic thing that we talk about ESG and the importance of ESG. Is the data any good now? And and and, and if not, can it get better? Can it well, come really a guy? Very good question. Right? Well, because the market is answering that question. Uh, today, a green bond responsible investing, ESG investing, whatever you want to call it, quite material. So the market's going to tell you which rating they trust. Uh, and currently they are trusting the ratings from two or three different organizations. But if you qualify as a green bond to a responsible rating agency, you get a huge benefit. So you know, the marketplace is already speaking here. Uh, the uh, key to me is how quickly we can make this transition. Uh, and the key to that is the, is the agreement on the standards, the agreement on the metrics. How do we measure the impact of what organizations are doing? And it's, it is evolving very quickly. You're correct. There's still some that aren't very credible. Uh, there is a debate going on at the level at which these things are decided. Uh, government does have a role here. Uh, things will look quite different in a year or two, but uh, we're in a pretty good place right now to the extent that these ratings are having an impact on the price people pay to borrow money. Mm -hmm. Okay. If, if, uh, you know, if I can be like, uh, I, although I agree there's a number of ratings, uh, although I think that the way some of these ratings are done, because we have discussion with some of the rating agents, we take that very seriously to go into detail element by element. The way it's done is still not very standardized. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, we talk about equity ratios. Okay? So some companies, because there's no real definition for the moment, will do an equity ratio around their overall employees. Some will do an equity ratio around the headquarter only on 100 employees. And that is the number that's being used after that by the rating agency to be able to calculate their index. So although there is a trend towards standardization, we are far from being there because I think it's going to take deeper in terms of basically making real definition and making sure they are compliant and people really follow them to be able to make it really measurable. And I think rating agencies and having the rating is good. I think beyond that, I think what companies have to do is to make explicit pledges around <coughs> different components of ESG say what action they are taking, and putting numbers out there in front of investors, in front of society, in front of their own teams, around what they plan to achieve by one. To complement whatever the rating agencies will do, which will take a bit more time to standardize, to frankly have all the metrics really strong, so I think it's the right direction, there's still some work to do. But I think it cannot only be just rating agencies defining, you know, 
what it is because whenever, whenever you have that, people basically try to find what is the right way to get the right score. Okay, so I think we have to complement that by real pledges from companies around what they're going to commit to and what they're going to deliver by when. In addition, I do believe that introducing, you know, uh, CSR or PSG or real metrics in terms of basically the variable compensation of leadership team, of CEOs, etc., is very important. I have in my variable compensation, you know, part of part with the CMP, I part of my compensation, which is linked to gender diversity and to achieving sustainability target in terms of actual reduction in terms of you know emissions. This is part of my objective. I measure on them. And if I don't achieve that, then I will lose part of my variable. I have we have we put that in the firm. We had one of the just as an anecdote, one of one of the countries was one of them. People take it seriously. But I think you have to make commitments outside in terms of what you're planning to achieve that goes beyond what the rating agency has to do. <clears throat> So, David, I want to bring you back in. So, so, you know, we've talked about, I mean, it, it, to me, uh, you know, from perspective at Harvard Business Review, it seems like an era has ended. And I don't know if it's the Reagan Clinton era or whatever you want to call it, but kind of a, the primacy of, of the shareholder era has, has ended. I'm not sure exactly what's coming, but it seems like we're, we're, <coughs> looks like we lost the minister, but let's hopefully she'll, she'll rejoin us. Um, you know, we're talking about employees who want to work for a company that has their values, which are often these sort of sustainable values. We're talking about, you know, consumers, uh, uh, you know, uh, investors who, who, who want to uh, engage with companies that share their values. I mean, you know, something is shifting to you. You know, in your mind, David, is it enough or, or, or what's missing in this, you know, relatively upbeat scenario I'm describing in terms of a shift that's happening? Well, just to sort of the, the rift off what was being said in the group and, um, you know, I mean, I think we're sort of all at the moment, we're sort of heavily in this, um, you know, this rating conversation, this ESG accountability conversation. Um, and I think it's obviously, you know, um, you know, as Armin was saying, you know, he, you know, when you have leadership, um inside the company and you, and you have accountability to yourself as an individual and as everyone was saying i should say as the minister was saying and uh, you know when you have accountability to yourself uh, as a human right um not looking at a machine but as a human to to a group of other humans who have families who have values who have you know doing the right thing is something that it's 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 it's, it's about being accountable to yourself and the leadership and the vision and the things that we're starting to see is these kind of narratives that we would have never seen in the corporate field are starting to come out um and that gives me optimism because we're starting to see behind this sort of this facade this this um let's call it this fi financial engineering that we see around the world um, and I think, you know, if you're lucky enough to be able to understand it and be in it and see it and see all these acronyms and, and, and kind of work with them, um, that's one thing. But the other side of it is that to be pervasive inside of society, we have to rebuild trust, right? We've lost trust. We've lost trust in um, fellow citizens inside of our countries. We've lost trust in um, the relationship between us and corporations and their intentions. We've lost trust in um, you know, many areas. I mean, we've seen this right now with the vaccine rollout. I mean, again, to come back to that, right? That the you know, educated people, people are just saying, well, they, you know, the they out there. Who are the they, right? Um, the cons the rise of conspiracy, the rise of misinformation, the rise of our addiction to, um, you know, algorithm-based advertising and content that pushes us to you know to to see things that say uh, that, that are fake narratives right so it's very hard for a lot of people to still today recognize that we are pushing up against our ecological boundaries right when you see in your feed uh, you know something that says you know climate change is not real it's just another tax right or you know this is just another way of getting money out of us or, or don't trust what you know the glaciers are just fine and you know the climate's always changed and so while there may be leadership that you know that's driving you know we've also got a, still a big part of society that's skeptical um not just of the the climate and, and these narratives but they're skeptical of, of of each other so it becomes it becomes you know multiple layers of, of interest and challenge um you, you know that we have to kind of get over but i think what's going to shift the market and what we will start to see right if you look at the investment that's just happened in china right in wind china has invested more in wind than 
Europe combined, South America, Middle East, and Africa. It has more wind that it's, it's invested in and, 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 and achieved. Why? Right? Because when you go to Beijing and you sit inside and you walk outside and the air is unbreathable, at some point, nature forces you to change. When you encroach on jungles and you find zoonotic diseases starting to creep in, which we've just seen, all of a sudden you say, maybe that biodiversity is important. Maybe that biodiversity protects us from another pandemic. So I think while we have all these rating systems and we have all these great things, CEOs are going to start to look at what I call the limitation of their natural capital, their natural capital resources, right? If you're sitting there, there are only so many trees. And I love all these tree planting programs. I'm involved in them. I'm involved in one called Sugi. And we make these big statements, not Sugi, but, you know, there's the trillion tree program. Da, da. We cut down trillions of trees every year. How many trillions of trees can you cut down before there's no more trees to cut down? Right. So when someone says we're planting 100 million trees, it's an amazing number. But if you're losing a trillion trees every year, you do the maths. And it's a very smart group on this, this call. You know, the same comes with water. If, if you're looking at water as a resource, only 2% of all our planet's water is fresh. If you are just doing, you know, you're not doing closed loop recycling of your water in your supply chain, any CEO will tell you that's one of the most expensive factors, right? Is if, you know, these res resource waste in the supply chain. So what we might see and what makes me optimistic is that, that you know we start to see not just ratings but we see the accountability to the resources that are going into the supply chain that actually cfos and ceos and the board say well wait a second this is inefficient and, and we start to see that changing so there is a lot more transparency now we're seeing what i would call these epls environmental profit and loss where the true you know, sort of uh, cost of doing business is factored in. So I think, you know, um, while I love people like Larry Fink coming out and saying, I'm going to be the, you know, the, the green messiah, but yeah, I'm still on the other hand going to be investing in, you know, and, and have hot, huge, you know, amounts of capital and businesses that are detrimental to nature. And everybody then runs to that and says, yeah, I'm going to write a letter as well. We have to. Sorry to just pick on Larry, but I think it's, he's, he's, you know, someone out there that has made that statement um, and now needs to be accountable to it. Um, but we now we, we're now going to see we, we now have to see it actually happen and accountability happen, which I do believe is happening. Um, so, again, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I just, I just want to uh, go on the trust issue. I mean, uh, trust is, is really the currency uh, that, uh, that, uh, of exchange between governments, businesses, citizens, and so forth. And how we reach trust, um, and this is, I mean, I was also uh, talking a few days ago on this agile governance, uh, aligning everyone around a vision. And, and you say that, uh, uh, you know, whether it's on environment or something else, but all stakeholders should be there. And we are identifying and aligning around a vision. And that's very, very important. And now with the green recovery being one key element uh, that we're going to be either judged on or, or as you mentioned, once we, if everyone runs out of natural resources, where are we going to get that element to consume in the, in, in the future? So, so aligning around the vision is extremely important. Second, communicating it. Uh, and, and here it's not, uh, as you mentioned, avoid communication or just coming up with a narrative that doesn't have uh, 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 substance, but really having a narrative, but that substantiating it all the time by, by, by the third very important point, and that is to have a metric or a matrix or a way to, to be accountable. So these are, there are principles uh, 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 that uh, create trust uh, there are principles that if you divert, you, 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 you lose credibility. And once that happens, whether you're a government or a business, uh, uh, you, you will be basically uh, losing a lot of equity and capital. And that is something that uh, uh, no policymaker or business owner uh, would want or can afford. So I, I, I feel that, you know, there is, there, I mean, having, having, uh, uh, these very important uh, discussions during COVID and post-COVID are really crystallizing and sharpening uh, uh, the way the way we uh, uh, together uh, need to work in the future. Mm. Hank, uh, as a frequent visitor to Beijing and New Delhi and ten other places I could mention, I have great sympathy for this point of view. Uh, but what I'm hearing is. Is ESG part of the facade of an organization or is it part of the foundation? And it's very clear to me that you can be successful with ESG well presented as part of the facade for short-term investors. 
Long-term investors, it has to be part of the foundation. So we are reflecting our investor base and the extent to which we have long-term invest investors who are concerned about the sustainability of the organization and society, the more effective we're going to be in dealing with the issues you're raising. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, uh, so I guess, uh, Ayman, we just have a, a, a couple of minutes and I'm going to give you the final word to uh, to reflect on everything we've talked about and, you know, g- give us your perspective, I guess, on, uh, I don't know, are you are you optimistic or pessimistic? So, at this point? so first thing, uh, David, I'm quite optimistic about what can be achieved today. I think there's a fundamental change. The fundamental change because you have a generation that will not take no for an answer. You have a generation that refuses to have a work life and a personal life. Okay? It's all mingled together. And they will not change what they believe the day they are at work and the, and the moment they are off work. And that gives a lot of hope because if you don't reflect who they are and you're not aligned with what they're aiming for, they will not be part of your company. You know, I have seen my kids having a different attitude than I would have had or they have died for a job in some companies. They look at it and say, no, I'm not interested in this company because they don't stand for what I want and I don't think I'm going to enjoy myself in that company, independent of better pay, better future, etc. So I see that gives hope. The second hope, you should get it from where I spend my time on, which is technology. You know, we are a technology company. I see what we can do today and how we can influence a number of these issues around sustainability is absolutely tremendous. We are currently developing a lot of new offerings you know, leveraging technology to help basically our clients reduce their carbon footprint. As I say, we are a service company. You know, I can reduce my carbon footprint by be, like we have done last year because people are not traveling. Okay, so this is my biggest emission. So for me, it's easy. So the pledge we have taken is not about reducing our own carbon footprint. It's how we're going to leverage technology to reduce the carbon footprint of our clients and help them get on a faster track in terms of sustainability and technology today. And the possibilities that technology can bring between the two, I'm very hopeful that things are going to fundamentally change. Okay, I am mindful of the time. It's a, it's a complex schedule today with a lot going on, but this is a great panel. I, I feel like we're, we're sort of just getting started and, and we're out of time, but I, I want to thank all of you for really, really valuable and thoughtful comments, and um, I think this is the point where we say goodbye. <laughs>